But yeah, my name's Edmund Gilbert, um, and I'm a third, nearly fourth year PhD student at the Royal College of Surgeons. So I came into the RHD and the Atlas project uh, relatively late, where basically all the hard work had been done. I just ran the analysis at the end. So this is um, what I'm going to be presenting tonight are the uh, the latest results that we've um, compiled in a paper that got recently published at the end of last year in a journal called Scientific Reports. So if you type this uh, title um, into the internet, you should probably you should be able to find the paper if you want to actually have a read of the actual document. Um, if all this is published data, so if you want to take photographs, that's completely fine. Um, a rare occasion when I'm actually presenting. Um, and below are a list of the authors on the paper. Um, and I'm the one at the front. So, Today I'm going to be talking about the main results of that paper, um, but first I thought to kind of introduce the concept of population genetics, um, also the genetics of Ireland as we knew it before we started this, um, this work, and then finally talk about the Irish DNA Atlas, um, and then talk about the main results of the paper for the main uh, uh, brunt of this presentation. So the main results of the paper were split into pages two broad groups of results, one investigating the population structure of Ireland, which I'll get into um, what that actually means, and then also we investigated uh, the genetic ancestries that are within uh, the modern Irish. So that's kind of the, uh, the bones of this presentation. So first of all, just to explain population genetics. So this population genetics do with, um, to do with humans, um, obviously you can um, use population genetics on lots of different organisms, but I study humans. So the human genome is uh, si about 6 billion letters long, we call them base pairs, and these letters are either A, T, C or G. Kind of like a binary code, um, but a base 4 system instead of base 2. Um, the genome can be thought of as a library to, of the blueprints of how to make a human being, um, and this library is organised into, or a book, sorry, um, and can be organised into chapters. And these chapters are called chromosomes, and they're separate part, um, bits of DNA. But you can put all of the DNA together, so if you put one copy of all my DNA in one of the cells, I think it's... Uh, I think the length of it is about as high as I am, if you just put the entire molecule side by side on, it, on, on its end. Um, and the basics of population genetics um, within any organism, but also with humans, is that human beings vary. So if you take um, two random people, um, two random humans, and you compare their, um, their genomes, about one in a thousand of these letters are going to be different in each person on average. And these are mutations, or variants as we like to call them sometimes. The scale of these mutations can vary, so they can be single letter changes in the genome, um, or they can be very large scale, so they can be whole swathes of a chromosome, duplicated, deleted, inserted, uh, changed, um, inverted, or whatever. And as you can imagine, this, um, the consequences of these mutations also um, are also varied. So the vast majority of these mutations are actually quite neutral. They don't really have an effect on you whatsoever, as an organism. But a smaller fraction of them will um, be deleterious to you as an organism, so they'll create a genetic disease, um, so for example, uh, cystic fibrosis. But an even smaller fraction may have a beneficial effect, so they will give you a selective advantage over your generational peers. So a good example is lactose um, persistence. So within the Irish, um, there is a mutation that allows you to continue digesting uh, lactose milk into adulthood. And we think that that's um, to do with uh, vitamin D um, metabolism and uh, uh, the, yeah, um, to do with that. So Irish genetics, if you compare Irish genetics to any kind of population within Europe, one of the defining signals of the Irish genome is this signal of lactase persistence, which is quite cool. <coughs> so population genetics is simply just the study of this variation between groups of humans. So that's what I do as a living, um, and it's rather interesting. So these mutations, these variants, um, can be inherited in um, different ways. So obviously from generation to generation, you inherit the, um, the DNA of your parents. But you have um, these two types of systems of inheritance, two modes, um, two streams of the river of, um, uh, of inheritance. One's uniparental and one's autosomal. So uniparental are, um, the, are a small minority of the genetic material that you carry on to your, um, to your children. Um, uniparental just means from one parent. So it's either the Y chromosome or the mitochondrial chromosome. So the Y chromosome is inherited from father to son, and the mitochondrial chromosome you inherit from your mother. So I inherit my Y chromosome from my mum, but if I had children, and if I had any children, they wouldn't inherit my Y chromosome. They would inherit the mother of my child's um, chromosomes, um, mitochondrial chromosomes. But for the Y chromosome, I would pass on that to uh, my son, but not obviously to my daughters. 
So the Y chromosome in the mitochondrial are very, very small compared to the whole genome. They're about um, less than 5% of the entire genome. <coughs> and there's very little what we call recombination. So in the general genome, um, parts of the genome are, um, are, um, are swapped and basically shuffled um, from copy to copy. And this um, creates new um, combinations of genetic material and is one of the reasons um, how, I, how genetic variation can, ex um, can happen. Because the Y chromosome is very small, for example, and doesn't recombine much, um, population differences, if you compare the Y chromosomes between two different populations, are exaggerated compared to the genetic variation that you see on the whole genome. So they're quite useful for <laughs> kind of an exaggerated viewpoint of uh, population genetics, but to get a more accurate, more uh, nuanced view on population genetics, you have to look at the autosome instead. So this is the vast majority of your genomes. This is chromosomes 1 to 22. And these um, have a 50-50, roughly 50-50 inheritance from your mum and your dad. And the majority of the genetic variation, as I said, is, are located on these chromosomes. And they recombine. And because they recombine, because they're so large, i.e. nearly 3 billion base pairs long, they're, very com as they're a very complex system to, uh, um, to study. And we haven't begun... And we haven't... Um, uh, studied the vast majority of the amount of mutation or variation in the genome. It's kind of like the bottom of the ocean. It's, we know some stuff that's in there, but a lot of it's kind of unknown. So the data that I'm going to be presenting today um, is based on the autosomes. We haven't actually generated uniparental um, data on the, one, on the um, using the average DNA atlas yet. So as well as uh, modes of inheritance and uh, population genetics in, to um, in general, um, I'm going to be talking a lot about genetic structure. So genetic structure is simply the stratification of uh, individuals based on their genetics. And this is because humans tend to group together to the exclusion of other groups. This may be for sociological reasons, or it may simply be because of geographic reasons. For the vast majority of human history in Europe, um, you're more likely to have a child with someone that also lives in Europe compared to someone that lives in Asia, for example. And because people tend to keep within their own groups at a continental scale or even at a country scale, the type of variation you see in these different groups varies because they keep the same sort of genetic material and same sort of genetic variation um, within that group. And this, is, and this is genetic structure, essentially, the different types of variation. So you may have the same mutation that are in all the populations in, in the world, but it's the frequency of that variation um, or that mutation itself might be the kind of the difference between populations. So this is genetic structure. And genetic structure um, is what we essentially detect when we run these analyses. This is a really good and very famous example of uh, the genetic structure that's found in Europe. It's from a paper in Nature 10 years ago. Um, so before I started my undergraduate, um, let's ignore how young I am. Um, so this is an XY plot um, through that's run, so you've got, so you've sequenced about a thousand European individuals, and you sequence their genome, so you've described their genome in about 600,000 different positions, and you've done this for a thousand individuals. So obviously this is quite a uh, complex data set, and it's very uh, multi-dimensional. I.e. that you could, um, come, you could describe one person <coughs> uh, 600,000 times, um, whether they have a mutation at that point, or whether they have a mutation at that point, so on and so forth. So PCA is just um, a simplification um, algorithm. And what this does is, um, output um, principal components, which are simply just dimensions. And what happens is, um, along a, a single dimension, individuals that are genetically related are on the same area of that dimension, so they cluster together. And individuals that are genetically far apart cluster away from each other. And you can see that on this plot. So each letter is um, an individual, and they're called by the country of origin. So this is an I and an E, so this is an island. E and S is Spain, um, IT is um, Italy. And, you, and this is purely done on genetics. So this algorithm has no idea where, the, where these people are born. And you can see that these um, that the peninsulas start to appear. So you've got the Iberian Peninsula down here, you've got the Italian Peninsula down here, the Falklands and Spain down here, France up here, and you can see Britain and Ireland over here. And this basically shows the main determinants of, um, of where your genetic material comes from is where you're born for the vast majority of um, history within, uh, within Europe, or at least modern histories in the last couple of thousand years. So this is really, really cool. This is, this is um, obviously made nature um, back in 2008. 
Um, but nowadays we're looking at more in detail on these individual populations. So we want to know what the equivalent of this <coughs> structure is within Ireland, for example, or within Spain. And this is essentially what I've been doing as part of my PhD, looking at fine scale structure, structure within a country. So to quickly uh, um, summarise the genetic work in Ireland, so to understand the genetics of Ireland, you have to kind of understand the, gene um, the geographic location of Ireland. So Ireland, if you've got the map of Europe, Ireland is all the way over here. So to get to France, you can go from Spain, you go from Italy, you go from Germany, or wherever. So that France is kind of uh, uh, France is quite, quite admixed. It's uh, the mixture of lots of different populations from different areas in Europe. But to get to Ireland, you usually have to either take a sea route up here, go through Britain, then to Scotland, and then do a small hop across um, the Irish Sea to Ireland. And therefore, relatively speaking, Ireland's quite isolated from Europe. So it's kind of like a reservoir of ancestry. And so this, um, and despite it's geographically close to Britain, you might expect it to be um, uh, distinct from Britain, because there has been a level of isolation between Britain and Ireland, um, historically. So, using very simple uh, methods back in the 60s, groups in Trinity looked at um, um, the frequencies of ABO blood groups within Ireland, for example. And you start to see some population structure, i.e. kind of the stratification of genetic material. So if we just focus on the O blood group and the A blood group, the different um, uh, shadings of hatching means uh, progressively more, fre more frequent, um, uh, with the greater frequency of these blood types. So you can see that O is more frequent in the west of Ireland, and A is more frequent in the southeast of Ireland. This is the first real evidence that there was some level of genetic structure within Ireland. We skip forward about 50 years, suddenly we're working with Y chromosomes. And we know that, um, and from, the, um, from these uh, papers, we know several things about um, the population genetics of Ireland. For example, Ireland and Scotland, to a lesser degree, is associated with this haplotype, Y chromosome haplotype, M269. And the haplotype is essentially just a type of Y chromosome. There's a subset of that um, M269 called the Irish modal haplotype, and it's associated in Ulster. So this is what I'm showing here on the right. This is kind of a heat map of where this Y chromosome is found, and you can see that it's really, um, it's really centered around the northwest of Ireland. There's also another separate haplotype that's associated with a north-south divided monster. So this shows that there is, there's also genetic structure if we look using Y chromosomes. So all these different methods are kind of looking at the, the structuring of the genetics of Ireland through a number of different lenses. And we're seeing through independent lenses that there, are, there does seem to be this stratification of individuals based on their genetics in Ireland. But we're not picking, we're only looking at either specific loci within the genome, and we're not getting the complete picture, which was what we could get if we used autosomal analysis. There was also done the work done um, investigating Y chromosomes, and uh, as an aside, they didn't find any evidence of Norse Y chromosomes associated with Norse surnames in Ireland. So we skip forward another couple of years, and we're now looking at autosomal data within Ireland. And we did some um, our lab um, about ten, nine, eight years ago. Um, did some of this work, and the preliminary work in Ireland suggested there was a lower, slightly lower genetic diversity in Ireland if you compare mainland Europe, which is what you'd expect considering its geographic isolation from Europe. Genetically, Ireland is distinct from Britain, but its closest genetic relatives are from Scotland, which you kind of expect given the history between um, Ireland and Scotland. There was also evidence found of our uh, genetic structure within the south, west and north of Ireland, and this came from a paper in Nature Communications last year. So these are three different kind of groups of individuals based on their genetics. And you can see that one's centered around the north, one centered around the south, and one centered around the west. Lastly, there's been work using ancient DNAs. Ancient DNAs really exploded in the last five or <coughs> six years. And this is because of a variety of different reasons. Um, but suddenly we have hundreds of ancient genomes, whereas um, 20 years ago this, this was like Jurassic Park kind of territory. So, at the moment, there are four published Irish genomes, one Neolithic, which is the first farmers of the island, and three Bronze Age individuals. So we know that the modern Irish genome was established during the Bronze Age. So if you look at the Bronze Age, this is a kind of a heat map of genetic affinity to modern populations. 
You can see the Bronze Age has the most affinity to Ireland, Scotland and Wales. But if you look at the Neolithic, it actually has the most affinity with Iberia as well as Sardinia. And this is saying that this is showing that um, the modern Irish, when they're not they're not descended mostly from the Neolithic, they're mostly descended from the Bronze Age. So to kind of wrap all of that up quickly, um, so we're seeing evidence of genetic structure in Ireland through different lenses. But what we don't know is using the autosome, what the extent of that structure is in a comprehensive review of the genetics of Ireland. But what we also don't know is the genetic impact of historical migration into Ireland. So I've said that Ireland's quite isolated geographically and historically, but that's not, that's not totally the case. There have been more historical migrations into Ireland, and those have bring, brought people, and they more, might have brought genes with them as well. But we don't know the historical impact of that, so we thought decide to investigate that using the atlas as well. Speaking of which, so the Irish DNA Atlas is a DNA cohort of individuals with regional, um, regional Irish ancestry. That's essentially it. What that means, though, is that when we recruit individuals, they have to have all eight of their great-grandparents born within the same region of Ireland, ideally within 50 or 30 kilometres. And this is a result of the, um, as a collaboration between the Royal College of Surgeons and the Genealogical Society of Ireland. And it really is quite unique around the, um, from around the world. There's no other cohort that um, combines this level of uh, genealogical data as well as genetic data together. On the right, you can see a map of um, the individuals that we've currently recruited. And each dot is the average latitude and longitude of uh, that individual's eight great-grandparents' birthplace. So essentially where their ancestry is coming from. And you can see that we've got coverage across the island of Ireland. We've got some areas that are kind of like gaps, but for the most part we've got even coverage across Ireland. So we've got both North Ireland, Northern Ireland and the Republic as well. So when we collect um, samples for the atlas, we collect uh, genealogical data, so name, birthplace, birth year, and that's for the individual, their parents, their grandparents and their great-grandparents. We also collect basic health questions in case we need to, in case we're investigating um, genetic diseases within Ireland. And of course we take informed consent. So each individual knows what we're going to be using their DNA sample for and how we're going to be using it. And then also we anonymise each individual. So each individual is given a code um, and then for the most part that code is used for that individual. Only a certain, only a subset of people are allowed to have access to the data that could allow you to join those two parts of the um, individual, um, data together. Of the samples, so each individual provides a saliva sample to us in the post. They kind of Combine it with uh, a preservative that allows um, the sample to just remain at room temperature for about 18 months, I think. So we just ship them off in the post. Um, we've got samples from Australia. I think we've got a sample coming in from New Zealand, right? Yes, at the moment. Yeah. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, so yeah, it's really um, this kind of like um, that technology is really useful for us. So the DNA is extracted at RCSI. Um, we do some called quality control just to make sure there's actually DNA in the sample and it's good DNA. Um, and then we store the DNA on site for um, various analyses. So at the moment we've got about 265 individuals recruited. The average uh, area between great-grandparents is about 30 kilometres. And the average um, date of birth of those great-grandparents is 1849. Which means that each individual on average represents the genetic diversity around Ireland in the mid-19th century. We've got kind of a snapshot of Irish genetics at that time for any major modern population movements. Um, and then on top of that, we've been genotyping. So genotyping is um, the collection of genetic data on individuals, running chemistry on their um, DNA and getting the results from that. So we've done two rounds of this genotyping, um, and we've generated autosomal data using those rounds of genotyping on, on, a, on, a, on a chip called a sniffer rate chip. It basically describes each individual um, 700,000 times. And we've currently um, genotyped 194 of those individuals. 194 of those individuals are included in the analyses that I'm going to present tonight. Speaking of which. So, first of all, I'm going to be talking about the population structure within Ireland, describing just the underpinnings of the variety within Ireland. So, to do this, we used a combined data set. So we combined our Irish DNA atlas with a few more Irish individuals just to boost our, our power to detect Irish genetics. And then we combine them with a data set of British individuals called the People of the British Isles Study. And this is a similar study to the Irish DNA Atlas, 
where they um, collected genealogical data, but they only took uh, grandparental data, not great-grandparental data. And so we use this combined data set to investigate structure both within Ireland and in Britain. So Ireland and Britain are quite interconnected, um, so it makes sense to analyse them in tandem together. One class down. So a structure in Britain we already know, this has been published uh, two years ago, um, well nearly three years ago. Um, and so um, this, is the, our, um, this is the people of the British Isles study. So each of these dots represents an individual place where their ancestry comes from. Um, and the colour and the shape of that dot um, is a genetic cluster that they've identified. So um, they've modelled these individuals as, I think, 17 groups of individuals. So within that group, that individual shares um, more genetic data with individuals in that group than they do with individuals outside that group. And you can see that these clusters are geographically uh, bound, if I can get the mouse working. So you've got Cornwall and Denner down here, North and South Wales, England, uh, Scotland, North and West, North, North Scotland and South, South West Scotland. But you can see that there's this big gap of Ireland, which we sought to fill in. So we took our combined data set of 2,000 odd individuals, um, which included about 500 Irish individuals. And we ran some kind of, uh, some basic uh, analyses just to check whether the data set was working. So there's principal component analysis that I've mentioned before, which kind of generates this kind of cloud plot of dots. So um, individuals that are genetically related kind of um, fall in with each other, and if they're not, they kind of fall apart from each other. And you can see that here. So we've got England in orange here, uh, Wales in red, Scotland in blue, Ireland in green, obviously, um, and Orkney in purple. So Orkney is a north, uh, uh, one of the islands or a set of islands up in the north of um, Scotland, and they're quite isolated. So that's the reason they fall away from everyone else quite um, so distinctly in this analysis. So what we saw was Ireland, um, we recapitulated um, what we already knew, essentially. Ireland's quite close to Britain, although, it's, um, although it's di despite that it's distinct, and its closest relatives are the other Celtic populations, so Scotland and Wales. This data used um, quite simple uh, genetic data, i.e. it recorded the allele frequencies, the frequencies of these mutations in all of the individuals. But mutations aren't inherited independently. They're usually inherited as chunks, what we call haplotypes. So these chunks are regions of the genome across all the autosomes, like chromosome 1 to 22, and they're all inherited together. And so if you can utilise this information, how the, um, the mutations are linked together, and inherited together, that's more data that you can use. If you've got more data, you've got more statistical power to be able to detect genetic differences between people. So we used instead haplotype-based data and ran the same sort of analyses. And now you start seeing um, groups of individuals uh, clustering away from each other at a finer scale. So for example, Wales is no longer related to, uh, or so related to Scotland and uh, Ireland in this analysis, and they've um, falls down over here. And you can see two broad groups starting to emerge. That might be North and South Wales. Um, Britain, um, England, um, sorry, is uh, over here. It kind of falls away from everyone else as well. Um, and then Scotland is separated into these two broad groups over here. And then Ireland is mostly found over here. But you've got these Irish individuals that kind of fall over to the Scottish or English uh, genetic space, which is quite interesting. So we took this haplotype data and then instead ran clustering analyses. So similar to what the po um, POVI guys did, we tried to model them as discrete genetic groups. So in this clustering analysis, we identified 30 Irish and British clusters. Of these 30, 10 included significant proportions of Irish individuals, kind of ignoring the odd cluster that had like one Irish individual in. Seven of these 10, we called Gaelic Irish clusters because 99% of the individuals in there were Irish uh, in ancestry. But three of these were mixed Irish and British membership. So they were predominantly a mix of Irish, English and Scottish to varying different proportions. So those three um, mixed clusters are up here. Um, they, we call them North Ireland clusters, one, two and three. And then the Gaelic clusters are down here. So what this tree is, is like clustering the individuals, we cluster the clusters, and we put them on branches. It's not an evolutionary tree, it's just simply a, um, a demonstration of the genetic relationships between each of the clusters. But you can see that all the Gaelic-Irish clusters 
putatively Gaelic Irish clusters to form their own branch down, down here. So you've got North and South Munster that fall away from everyone else, then Ulster, and then Leinster, Central Ireland, Dublin, and Connacht. And these names we gave to them after this analysis. We didn't, this analysis is completely <coughs> blind to geographies, it's just purely based on genetics, which sometimes you've got to keep reminding yourself because the detail that it sometimes kicks out is just incredible. So these cl this cluster, these clusters are quite it's just a tree, it's not very it's not very visual. You can't really see a lot of the genetics in here. So what we did was take those individuals and map them according to where their ancestries are from. So you can see within Ireland, um, sorry, within Britain, we kind of we describe the same sort of structure that you see on and saw on the previous uh, map that Poby outputted. <coughs> within Ireland, we've now filled in Ireland. So you can see these different clusters. Um, and they're geographically bound as well. Predominantly these, these blue triangles and green uh, circles, this is North and South Munster, and they perfectly describe the boundaries of pro the province of Munster. You've got Ulster up in purple over here, you've got Leinster down in red, Central Ireland is kind of belt cluster, you've got Dublin over here in green, and Connacht in orange. And then also we've got the North Island clusters, the largest of which are North Island 2, Where's my mouse? There it is here. Um, and North Island too are these blue crosses, and they're shown, and that, um, and they are um, shared across both um, the southwest of Scotland, but as well as the north of England over here. So suddenly we're starting to see both these clusters that are purely are uh, purely Irish, and these clusters that are shared <coughs> between Ireland and Britain, and they're they're not found just randomly across Ireland, not scattered randomly. They are in specific regions, and this is telling us that people in Ireland, historically, have been preferentially breeding with people that are proximate. There's some interesting kind of features that are hidden in here um, within Ireland. So for example, the county of Clare, that used to be part of Connacht, apparently, if I've done my research right, but now it's part of Munster. And you see that reflected in the genomes here. So they're a mixture between um, clusters <coughs> found in Connacht and clusters that are found in Munster as well. The level of detail on this map is, was just incredible when I first did it. It's pretty good. It's a good day at work. So by way of showing, so this all looks very dramatic. So we're able to show the different regions of Ireland, how different they are. The differences are very, very tiny. The only reason that we're able to detect these is because we're using really powerful techniques and we've chosen our samples really carefully. So we're using techniques, so your laptop may have like four processors. We're running analyses that use like 64 processors over the course of a day or two. It's kind of like the computational power that's required for this sort of analysis. So, way of the comparison. So I've um, put these, these numbers. These are genetic distances measured by FST, if you're interested in the, um, the estimator. So, for example, the average FST between Ireland and England is 0 0.0008. And so the smaller the number, the, gen and the closer these two populations would be. That seems, that's kind of like a, just a random number. But by way of a comparison, Within Ireland, so within our Gaelic Irish cluster, <coughs> it's 0 0.002, it's so nearly an order of magnitude smaller than a genetic difference between England. If we compare our Gaelic Irish clusters to our mixed Irish clusters, that's 0 0.0038. So slightly larger, um, but still quite small. So these, um, these Irish British individuals that are in North Ireland, they're not that genetically distinct. From, uh, from Gaelic Irish, um, the differences between um, Gaelic Irish. But they're still, you can still detect them. And lastly, is by way of a comparison, if you take the FST between Ireland and Spain, um, that's 0 0.0037, so an order of magnitude larger than the difference between uh, Ireland and England, I think. Yeah, something like that. So just by way of a comparison. So the structure that we see within the British Isles and Ireland is incredibly fine. Um, in the grand scheme of things at a continental scale, but we're able still to um, be able to detect it. So I thought it might be quite interesting to show that um, as a sign of us, um, to show the genetic differences of the, uh, the largest genetic groups and sequentially the, mo the most finest scale of differences within Ireland as this kind of animation. So over here we have um, all our Irish individuals kind of like greyed out and they haven't been assigned a cluster yet. But if we assign the individuals that are the most genetically distinct first, these are the North Irish clusters, and they're found predominantly up in the north. Then the second largest difference in Ireland is Munster, away from everyone else. And then after that, it's Ulster. And then after that, it's this kind of 
uh, Leinster sort of um, Central Ireland cluster. After that, we're splitting uh, the North Ireland clusters um, up into their constituent parts, into their individual three clusters. And then we assign the last remaining individuals to the Connacht and the Dublin uh, clusters. So now we've assigned all our Irish individuals to a group. So after this, it's kind of just the, the splitting hairs part, the kind of uh, just the, the really fine level details within Ireland. So we identify the difference between the North and South Munster. And then we split uh, Central Ireland and Connacht, uh, Central Ireland and uh, Leinster apart. So maybe uh, maybe uh, wondering or kind of realizing that some of these clusters look awfully awfully like socio-political boundaries in Irish history. So I've taken um, 800 AD just as a by way of a comparison, but you can take other um, other other time periods are available. So. You can see that um, the Kingdom of uh, Munster down here, kind of somewhat, um, uh, sorry, the Kingdom of Munster over here, kind of mirrors uh, the genetics of Munster over here. Same with Leinster, same with Ulster. So this is kind of just supposition. It's not really statistically significant at all, but it does produce a really nice slide. So I thought to show. It. So what this suggests possibly is that this genetic structure. Now, we haven't been able to date this genetic structure, but this genetic structure could be as a result or could be an echo of these political groups um, in Irish history. So that's the ge population genetics in Ireland, um, or the population structure, as I, um, should I say, in Ireland. So it's how Ireland has stratified and ordered itself, genetically speaking. But those actual genetic groups within Ireland, what are they made of? So first we looked into these mixed clusters, these clusters of uh, shared um, Irish and British ancestry. Because they were of shared Irish and British ancestry and they were in the north of Ireland. So they're obviously quite, um, they're quite interesting. So they're mainly found in Ulster, although some of them are found in Dublin. So there are several hypotheses that the, how these clusters could occur. They could just be a reflection of just passive gene flow between Ireland and Britain. So over the millennia, people have just taken a vote over the ROC, or um, both sides of the ROC, and kind of mixed with um, the different populations there. And what we're seeing here is just a reflection of that, kind of a subset of, um, of individuals with Irish ancestry that are of mixed Brit um, British and Irish ancestry. Or it could be due to specific events in history. One, uh, one single migration that came over from Britain or into Ireland and mixed with um, vice versa. And then suddenly you have this admixed population, this mixture of both Ireland and British. Or it could be a combination of both. So we investigated that population model of uh, admixture point. So we used a program called Globetrotter, and we investigated this in all three of the mixed clusters. But I'm just going to discuss the results of the largest of these um, clusters, uh, North Island 2, simply because they're a little bit more robust, and it was 100 individuals in North Island 2 compared to 30 odd individuals in Ireland, North Island uh, 1 and 3. <coughs> So we found statistically uh, significant results um, or evidence that there was an admixture event sometime in, into the north of Ireland, predominantly from the north of England. And this was sometime in the early 17th century. But interestingly, what we found was evidence of prior gene flow, i.e. kind of mixture between Ireland and Britain, into the north of Ireland. So what we're seeing is that the genetics of the mixing between Ireland and Britain is very complicated. You can detect these uh, admixture points, these pulse of that, these single pulses of admixture, but you have to take into account that on top of that, you've just got kind of a low level gene flow across Ireland and Britain, historically speaking, and that muddies the water. So this is basically the kind of the detail that we were able um, to detect and pass that. The more waters are so muddy that it was rather hard to detect anything else. So another way to, do, um, to describe all of those results, just to look at the surnames. We've got genealogical data, let's have a look at them. So what we did was um, take all of the great-grandparents' uh, surnames and then classify them according to uh, some broad uh, surname origins. So Gaelic, Gallic, Glass, Scottish, Anglo-Norman, English, Welsh, Manx, Scandinavian, and even Breton. And then we found their uh, frequency in each of the ten clusters, so the three <coughs> North Island clusters at the top, and then the Gaelic clusters uh, at the bottom. 
Um, and you can see the total of the surnames uh, that we show um, in each of the clusters over here. So you can see that the Gaelic clusters are predominantly uh, made up of uh, surnames that are Gaelic in origin, although interestingly Dublin has a slightly lower percentage of that, slightly elevated levels of both Scottish and English surnames, <coughs> although you'd kind of expect that. And then in North Ireland 3, 2 and 1, you have various proportions of English, Scottish and Irish surnames. And interestingly, that mirrors uh, the, genetic, um, uh, the genetic proportions of Irish, British, um, Irish, Scottish and English um, ancestry. So North Ireland 3 has the highest amount of Gaelic ancestry, um, and that has, um, has also the highest um, proportion of Gaelic surnames, so on with um, North Ireland 2 and North Ireland 1. So the surnames, unsurprisingly, are, mi are mirroring sorry, uh, the genetic variety that we find in these clusters. And these significant differences are significant. So we did a simple uh, student test. Student test? Student test. Yeah, I think it was a student test. It is a simple student test, um, and the p-value is very significant. Basically what this means is that if you are, if by genetics, if you are assigned to a North Island cluster, you're six more times likely to have an English surname somewhere in your ancestry at the great grandparental level. And if you, um, with the Scottish surnames, roughly the same p-value, well, exactly the same p-value, but you're 25 times more likely to have a Scottish surname um, in your eight great grandparents, which is remarkable. So we also looked into um, ancestry from ancient Ireland into our modern Irish clusters. So you're seeing uh, genetic differences um, in different regions in Ireland, but that might be because different regions in Ireland have different proportions of ancestry from different re um, periods in Irish history. So for example, Munster could be distinct because they're um, more early farmer um, than Bronze Age. So we used two samples, a Bally and a Hattie sample, which is uh, representative of the Irish Neolithic, and the Rathlin one, which is uh, representative of the Bronze Age. So first of all, the Irish farmer. We basically see no statistical significance between um, Ireland. So this plot shows uh, the higher the value, the higher amount of uh, ancestry that we can model and the um, Irish farmer is uh, uh, contributing to these populations. So these values are kind of relative rather than um, empirical. But you can see that it, and the Irish um, farmer actually shows roughly the same amount of proportion across the British Isles, which would make sense considering those heat plots that I showed right at the beginning of this presentation, where in fact um, the Irish farmer has far more in common with the Iberian Peninsula and Sardinia than it does with Ireland. Within the Bronze Age, we show a similar sort of pattern in the fact within Ireland, so that there's no real statistical difference between different regions in Ireland. Although the Celtic populations within Britain and Ireland um, show, the um, show the most amount of ancestry from the Bronze Age, which again reflects previous results. So what this is showing us is that the population structure that we observe within Northern Ireland isn't due to differential, for, um, differential ancestry from different regions in Irish history. This post-dates the Bronze Age. And then finally we looked at European ancestry. So we wanted to see whether different regions in Ireland, or Ireland or Britain, have uh, different affinities um, to uh, regions within Europe. So for example, if a load of Spanish dropped shore um, ages ago um, into Munster, we'd, show, we'd probably see that and detect that using this analysis with a massive spike in Spanish ancestry in Munster. This is kind of the idea. So we modelled Ireland and Britain as a mixture of various European sources. And these sources are shown on this map here. So these pie plots are shown in different collection centres across um, Europe. And where they're coloured in um, is a particular um, DNA source from a genetic group in Europe. So for example in France we can broadly separate it out into this uh, kind of yellow, orange, red, um, red, orange, kind of doesn't really come out in this really well, but of, oh, just trust me, orange, uh, red and yellow, which is different from this yellow in Belgium. So the yellow is more the south of France, the red is more kind of north east of France, and this orange is more north, uh, northwest of France. <laughs> Brittany, yeah. So, and the same with um, Norway, Germany and whatever. So we <coughs> reported the sources, the, um, the uh, European sources that contribute at least 2.5% ancestry to any one Irish or British cluster. So this means that we're reporting the major determinants of ancestry under this model. So that's shown here. So along the y-axis you can see each individual European source that we kind of cherry pick. Cherry pick, but yeah. 
um, along the x-axis are each individual Irish or British cluster. And they're ordered according to kind of um, population. So you can see this France 1 cluster um, contributes a lot of ancestry under this model. And this France 1 cluster is that uh, northwest France uh, region. And we think that this is just reflective of um, a common Celtic signature um, between Celtic populations of uh, Cornwall, um, of uh, Wales, and Scotland and Ireland. In fact, you can see um, Cornwall in this analysis because it's that one, looking distinct from the rest of the English populations. And as you would expect, Ireland has the largest proportion of this kind of uh, Celtic ancestry. I use Celtic as a describer, not as a kind of an archaeological uh, term. Um, what you can see also is that within these German, uh, po um, German populations, um, within green, that um, there's particularly low levels within Ireland um, compared to, say, England, which is kind of what you'd expect. There's been more Germanic influence within England um, compared to Ireland. But interestingly, we found this high level of Norwegian ancestry within Ireland, particularly from using this Nor um, uh, Norway 10 signature. And this signature was really similar to the signature that we find in Orkney. So Orkney has a well-documented history of Norse um, of Viking um, activity at the cultural level as well as the genetic level. So we started to investigate further in this Norwegian signature, and we found that there is evidence of a Norwegian signature in uh, into Ireland, and we can date it. It dates around the turn of the first and second millennia, around the time of the Norse Vikings. And actually, um, uh, a separate group in Trinity have um, have confirmed these results since, which is always really nice. Um, so, really surprisingly, compared to the, uh, um, considering the Y chromosome uh, work earlier, we've we found a significant proportion of Norwegian ancestry within Ireland, which is something that we weren't really expecting, to be honest, from this analysis. Um, and so with that, the most exciting results out of our paper, I'd like to just finish by summarising some additional work that we're doing at the moment. Um, so this is a nice end of chapter of using the Irish Gene Atlas, but we're going to continue using the Irish Gene Atlas for um, analysis um, solely using it, or using it in conjunction with other data sets and other um, pipelines. So for example, we're using uh, Irish Gene Atlas to investigate the links between Ireland and Iceland. There's only one constant between them. So um, the Irish Atlas uh, was used in an investigation that um, looked into the founding of Iceland using uh, modern source populations as well as ancient Icelandics. Can't show you any data because it's not published yet. Um, and, we, and so we provided the modern Irish references. But what is an interesting work for the further work that we might be doing in the future is that what, which regions in Ireland um, did, uh, what, went over to Iceland? Was it from any, from any region in Ireland or were they from specific regions in Ireland? So that's what we're going to be having a look at. We're also using the Atlas um, investigating Irish traveller genetics. So a load of work that I also do is on uh, the genetics of Irish travellers and a genetic isolate found within Ireland. So we've been using the Atlas, for example, to investigate ancestry within um, the Irish travellers. So as a quick explanation, we've at the moment managed to group the Irish travellers into four different genetic groups, like those genetic clusters that I've been explaining with the Atlas. And we've been comparing their ancestry to different regions in Ireland. And we find that these two um, clusters, uh, Tribal 1 and 2, are predominantly have ancestry predominantly from the north and the west of Ireland. And these clusters have uh, ancestry predominantly from the south and the east of Ireland. And actually, if you look at the languages spoken by these two groups, or two groups of two, um, their languages are associated with those different regions as well, which is really cool. So that's kind of what we're doing as well. I hope I haven't bored you too much. I'd like to acknowledge the um, the following people. Uh, JP and Sean, who are my supervisors, part of my PhD. Um, Seamus, Michael and Darren, as well as to everyone else at GSI that have helped with this uh, cohort um, since its inception. Uh, to Sophie, who's a, um, who was a summer student um, that was working on the Traveller data. Jim, Dan, Desi, um, who have uh, variously um, helped and uh, advised me in different analyses techniques. The Irish Centre for High End Computing, so that's where we do all these analyses on their big supercomputer. Otherwise, this would have taken like 12 years. Um, and finally, to Science Foundation Ireland. Oh no, not so far, finally. To Science Foundation Ireland for funding my PhD, otherwise I would be here. And then also, finally, to the Irish DNA as participants, because we wouldn't be able to do this without them. Um, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>